Okay, now this video is going to go through bounds, and in particular there are two main things to do with bounds that I'm going to go through. So the first thing which I'm going to go through is making sure that you're able to find uh, or determine the upper and lower bounds for a given number, depending on how it's been rounded. And the second thing that I'm going to go through is making sure you understand upper and lower bounds in calculations, which can be a slightly trickier idea, and it doesn't always follow what you think is going to happen. So the first key concept that I want to go through is about how to find the upper and lower bound for a given value after it has been rounded. So in this example here, we've got the value of a being 12.4 to one decimal place. And the way in which I'm going to explain what the upper and lower bounds are going to be is by using a number line. So when we have 12.4 and it's been rounded to one decimal place, what it means is that there's some values which are a bit bigger or smaller that would round to 12.4. They'll either round down or they're going to round up. And what that means is that there's other values either side of 12.4 that are values haven't rounded to. They didn't go to 12.3 and they didn't go up to 12.5. So there are these boundaries, there are these points in between where we would choose to round up or down. And that's what we mean by an upper or lower bound. So because it's round to 12.4, that means that our lower bound and our upper bound are placed halfway between these values on this number line. So our lower bound is going to be 12.35 and our upper bound is going to be 12.45. Now there will be some who are not quite comfortable with the upper bound being 12.45 because they'll see that as a value that rounds up to 12.5. Now we're not saying the value is 12.45, we're just saying that that is a boundary, that is a point where there would be a change of rounding. And so our values are typically in between and so the best way to show this is with an inequality. So when it comes to representing this as an inequality, it is going to look like this, where you're going to have the lower bound to the left and the upper bound to the right. Now you'll notice that the choice of inequalities used means that on the left, 12.35 would be included as a potential value for A, whereas on the right, 12.45 would not be included because we don't have the equals to part. And this is something that's quite important with the inequality, just to make sure that it's very accurate when it comes to describing what the values of A could be. Now, in this example, what I've got is a GCSE question or part of a question where it does look at getting you to find the upper or lower bound. And in this case, it says the upper bound of the width. Now, you notice that the rounding has been to two significant figures, so you do need to be aware of how that works. But if we actually look at what that means for our value, because the width was 18 after rounding, and the kind of rounding we've done would be to the nearest whole number, that means that our upper and lower bounds are going to be placed partway in between the nearest whole numbers. So we've got 17.5 for the lower bound and 18.5 for the upper. But because the question only asks for the upper bound, we don't need to put that as an answer. Now, this would be a very basic kind of question to get. What I'm going to go through next is a slightly more complicated type of question and a different idea that you could have that involves bounds. Now, in this next part, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this idea of what happens in a calculation where we're being asked to find the upper and the lower bound for, say, two values which have been rounded. And we're going to say add, subtract, multiply and divide. Now, some of these will work as you would expect. They would follow the kind of ideas that would make the most sense, but a couple of them don't. And to try and represent that, I've color coded it so that you can see that when we add and multiply, it would actually work how you think, whereas subtraction and division don't. So if you wanted the upper bound for A add B, you would choose the upper bound for A and the upper bound for B, because you'd want the two biggest values when you add together. And whilst that's going to be true for, say, adding and multiplying, it doesn't hold true for subtracting and division. And so I'm going to go through an example to illustrate that next. So in this example, what I've done is I've took those values of A and B and I've written their upper and lower bounds and I've used some color coding just to sort of help clear up what's going on. But if we're going to start looking at finding the upper and lower bound for, say, A minus B, what we're going to have to realize is that there's four different combinations that we could do. We could use both lower bounds, we could use both upper bounds, but we could also use a mixture of upper and lower bounds for A and B. And because there's these four combinations, we need to understand, well, which one is going to give us that overall upper bound and that overall lower bound. So in this table of results, what I've got here is I've worked out all the combinations and to the right, you've got the answers and we've color coded in the middle to show all the combinations we've used. Now, when it comes to finding the upper bound for A minus B, you're going to want to use this combination. 
Now this combination uses the upper bound for A and then it uses the lower bound for B. Now when you think about it, that will give you the biggest possible answer for A minus B. You're going to start with the largest value and you're going to take away something which is the smallest possible value. And similarly, if you did want to find the lower bound, you're actually going to want to use your smallest possible value of A and then subtract from that the largest possible value of B you can to give that smallest answer possible. And so what I've done below is I've summarized this. Now I have used notation that's not something that I've used, seen in books, but it does give the idea across that if you want to find your upper or lower bounds for a subtraction, what bounds you should be using for your individual values. Now the rules for division are exactly the same as they are for subtraction. So you still want to have your upper and lower bounds in the order that they're indicated here. Now depending as to your understanding, you may want to uh, say remember these, you might want to memorize them and make a note of them. Other people might have got the idea and generally would just not need to remember it and would be comfortable in applying this, but that's going to be down to you. Now what I'm going to go through next is a GCSE exam style question, which I've modified a bit just for the purpose of this video. So here I've got a GCSE style exam question where I've modified it so that we've got a different question to what was being asked. But we are going to focus on finding the upper bound for C. And if we look at the formula, you can see that the calculation does involve division. So we've been told that the values have been rounded to three significant figures. But if we're going to find that upper bound of C, we're then going to need to make sure we do this calculation where we find the upper bound of D and divide it by the lower bound of F. This would then make sure that the value that we get at the end of that calculation would be the largest possible value we can have. So finding our bounds using the ideas that were discussed earlier in the video, we would then perform the division. And in this case, I've rounded the answer sensibly at the end. Now these types of questions um, have appeared before, so you may come across them in past GCSEs, but there's something which in the one to nine may come in a different style of question. This one here actually asked you to consider uh, the most appropriate value for C. And so if you look to all four combinations, you would then get four different answers and you can start to see what kind of answer would be the most appropriate. But it does work on this idea of considering that there are various bounds that you can calculate. And when you are looking for the maximum and the minimum or the upper bound and lower bound, which bounds you must use in order to calculate. Hopefully you found this video useful in discussing the ideas of bounds. Uh, please leave a comment and let me know what you think. Thank you.